this a little bit closer? Yeah. Now? Better? Keep coming. Keep coming closer. There you go. All right. Okay. So I actually really liked the analogy last night about the elephant. So I'm going to use that a little bit as well. Uh, the elephant that I'm going to be talking about is the Mount Pleasant community planning process. And I wanted to start out with just a real general overview of what that looks like. Uh, because I know when I came to the Mount Pleasant community process, it took me several months to really understand what it was going to be. So I'll just provide a bit of context. So in the early summer of 2007, the city sent out invitations asking people if they wanted to volunteer for the community liaison group. And this was followed by poster presentations or poster sessions inviting ideas at different community events. The city then started outreach to about 90 organizations and groups in the community, introducing the process and gathering ideas. After a pause for the city strike, the first community liaison group, which you're going to hear me say CLG a lot, that's what that is. So the first community liaison group meeting was attended by 60 people. And although about a third of the, only about a third of the people continued until the end. Then followed a series of workshops that were community-wide, usually held for five hours on a Sunday afternoon. We usually broke into small groups and we walked around the neighborhood before discussing observations and ideas for the future. Notes, maps, and drawings from these sessions became part of the material that the planners used and that the community liaison group reviewed. A social coordinating group and a heritage working group were also formed. Once all of this data was collected, the CLG and the planner worked together to establish draft directions for the community plan. Um, these draft directions then went to a series of five open houses in the community for testing and to see how people felt about them. Those open houses were tended by over 600 people. We got 200 questionnaires back from that. And so from that point, the planner and the CLG again worked together to finalize the plan. And it was approved last November by City Council. So back to the elephant analogy. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm really only touching one part of the ele elephant here. I'm a member of the community liaison group, and that's just a really small portion of that overall community planning process. And I just wanted to make sure people know that I'm speaking from my own experience. I did ask for some input from other community liaison group members, but basically what I'm saying today is my own. It's not an official um, presentation from the group. Um, I joined the community liaison group at the first meeting and attended a few of the workshops, and then I had about a year in the middle of the process where I didn't participate, and then I came back later on. So out of the four years, I am missing about one year of direct participation. So overall, this is what I think we learned and what made the process successful. So it was basically a four-year community building process. We walked around the neighborhood with our neighbors. There was food at meetings, so we ate together. We grappled with community issues with our neighbors. I know the history of my community much better now, and I know my neighbors much better. It's basically strengthened the web of our community. Community consultations are currently underway for our first major development project since the community plan was approved. And I think that we're in a much better place uh, as a community to work through this kind of a consultation, just because we know each other that much better. So it's basically helped us build a kind of community sustainability or social sustainability that I think is necessary before we can look at any other kind of sustainability. Uh, another thing that worked quite well, I thought, was that the process was designed to make it as easy as possible for people to participate. So there were different kinds of events that people could come to. People could join the community liaison group, they could attend an open house, they could stop by a booth at a street festival, or they could join a specific working group to look at a specific issue. And there were different formats for participation as well. So I could fill out a questionnaire at the event, I could fill out a questionnaire online, I could speak with a translator at an event to discuss and then fill out a questionnaire. Um, I could talk to the planner directly, I could put my ideas on a sticky note and put it on a wall at the workshop. Um, I could be part of drafting a community drawing with a planner. A group of youth from the Broadway Youth Resource Center did a video project around neighborhood planning issues. Um, and then there were also groups where there was a concern if we would be able to, with those methods, um, ensure participation. And so there were specific groups 
that city planners approach directly to do smaller focus groups. So seniors, youth, homeless community members, and specific language and cultural groups were approached for smaller focus group sessions. Childcare was often offered, and I think that this variety in the ways that people could participate in the process um, made it so that we could get a wider diversity than we would have been able to, been able to otherwise. Um, I also believe that this was the first community planning process in Vancouver to have a social planner involved. Um, and so this was a real plus for our community. So it meant that as we were planning land use and looking at buildings and physical structures, there was also a real emphasis on social issues in our neighborhood and the social context. And those two, those two processes moved along beside each other. Um, and the social context really informed the whole planning process. The social coordinating group actively worked on a number of the social issues that were identified by the community. And so we do have some enduring projects uh, from that process. Uh, there's a project called Bike Back, that's one, uh, where stratas that have bikes that have been abandoned in their, their bike lockers can donate those to a community, it's a, a bike repair skills building program. So there, there's connections like that that have been made that are gonna stay with the community for a while. Uh, the Heritage Working Group also consciously worked to redefine what heritage actually means in Mount Pleasant. So we decided that it's not just the buildings on the Heritage Register. It includes the streams, it includes landscape, arts, um, how industry developed in Mount Pleasant, basically stories. And so the community was quite strong um, in saying that the definition of heritage needed to be broader than, than what, it might, what we might think when we first think about it. Uh, so basically, we don't just want to preserve heritage in our community, but we also want to create new heritage. We were also, or I felt quite blessed in the process to have someone from the last community planning process involved. So the chair of the last community planning process in Mount Pleasant from 20 years ago was a member on the community liaison group. And I think that really helped us to bring that historical perspective and to remember that the idea is it's a 20-year plan, and the change isn't all going to happen next week. Um, the community liaison group, I think, was an essential piece of the process. It's the part where I spent most of my time, and our role basically was governance. We were a watchdog over the process. So sometimes the city would come to the community liaison group and say, where are good venues in your neighborhood to hold this kind of event? Or are there other groups that we're missing that we need to contact? Am I getting short on time? Okay. Um, and so in the community liaison group, we each had to remember what that mandate was and leave our own personal agendas behind at the door. So that was the big challenge with the community liaison group, but it was also the big um, advantage because our job was to read through those transcripts with the planners and make sure that the community's ideas really were reflected. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say a couple more sentences. Um, there were, I think another strength was that we identified which points in our neighborhood were points of least convergence, and those are issues that um, we, still need to, we still need to address in our neighborhood. So the plan isn't set in stone on every single issue. And that brings me to what I think is the biggest learning of the process, is that we need a mechanism for working on these points of least convergence in our neighborhood. The communities involved with the development process at the very beginning with this 20-year community plan. And then if you think of in the context of a specific site development, community isn't involved again until the very end of the process. And that's a, that's a concern for us. Um, so for a specific building, it would be much better if we could be involved in the process earlier on. And so something that's been discussed in our neighborhood is could a, a neighborhood um, area council fulfill that need? Engaging on development issues uh, in the longer term and engaging on development issues earlier in the process. And so that, I think, is, is one of the main messages I wanted to bring. So thank you. <laughs>